Hi, welcome to the Macabre Emporium. Let me get my emotional support cat. Okay. <laughs> to be quiet and keep the kids quiet, since he was getting anxiety and he didn't want to kill children. Gertrude's daughter even got to join in on what they considered fun. Tell us about the giant turtle. Alan never showed up, nor was he ever heard from again beyond that point. Welcome back to Macabre Emporium. You're joining us for episode 12. And if it's your first episode, welcome. In your case, it would be episode one. <laughs> You've got 11 to catch up on. Yeah, shouldn't take you too long. If you binge new shows like Sarah and I possibly will do Yeah. at times. Yes. Earlier today, Sarah and I got procrastinated by a show called Urban Legends on the Travel Channel with the Eli Roth. Which I was kind of a little surprised Sarah didn't know who Eli Roth was because she had to ask me and I was <laughs> shocked. <laughs> I only ask because the name doesn't sound familiar to me and on Facebook I see his shit come across like I'm friends with him. Like, I don't know who the fuck he is. Right. But I mean, after you told me. But now she knows who he is. <laughs> I was a little bit shocked, like I said. And he also did another movie, but it was basically about cannibalism and like the Amazon, I think. But I don't mm. remember the name of it. Um... For those that might not know who Eli Roth is, I'm sure you've seen his movie Hostel, because I remember when that movie first came out that everyone was like, oh my god, this movie's so gross, you know. I thought it was awesome. It was. So, you, so you've watched Hostel and you didn't realize who that yeah. was? Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, so after I saw it, I remember having to go to a bathroom somewhere and having my foot next to the stall. Right there. <laughs> I was like, nope, I'm going to move my foot over a little bit closer to uh, out, of, out of the reach of the stall next to me i don't think i've ever watched a movie that has creeped me out bad enough that i'm like oh, you haven't oh. seriously okay what were we, what kind of truck were we behind last week <gasps> oh, or two yeah. weeks ago when we yeah. were coming back from visiting your dad the log but truck no, but no movies ever gonna not not like scary movie like i don't want to go to the bathroom mm -hmm. alone kind of shit yeah I think I'm the only person on the planet who can give two shits about being behind a log truck after seeing final destination because it doesn't bother me like it does most people. I don't know. Maybe I'm the fucking weird one. Mm, that's um, not. That's not a question. <laughs> anyhow, uh, the show is called Urban Legends, and it, it, they are all an hour long for the few that we did see, yeah. and they're like the telling of urban legends in a horror style type of way. They yeah. were quite good, and it was like we watched what four episodes before I was like, we need to go get our shopping done before it gets too late. Yeah, there was like the choking Doberman. Uh, the harvest, which was like, you know, harvesting your kidneys, whatever. Yeah, the white dress, which is one of the most yes. common ones that's known of. I think it was only those three. Yeah, we caught, uh, it was t choking over and we caught the tail end of them. Right. So. They you were good, though. If you want to see a twist on old stories, check out Urban Legends on the Travel Channel with Eli Ra. There has been a few things I've sent some emails out to, uh, in the, out onto the interwebs, and I've gotten some positive responses come back. Um, one... Is from a webcomic that's going to draw a picture of Sarah and I. Yes. That we have need to go send him back the information and the pictures yep. he's required for it. So we'll share that with everybody as soon as it's completed. And I had taken a shot. I had taken it as a very long shot. Sent an email off to a podcaster that could be considered one of the pillars of the paranormal podcast community and he actually had a response back and said he's interested in doing an interview with me which is surprising for as small as our show is so would he be on ours or who you would be on it's his a cross promotion event he will so, come on ours okay and i will go on his and tell him one of the stories that i have yeah. of the paranormal yeah is what it's going to be okay so but Ginger yes. says hello. Yep, and Ginger's excited for me for that news that she, she made her presence known today on the counter. <laughs> that so, is exciting. Yeah. So, with all of that fun information announcements for our show for today, I will be doing a an, an promotional for another show for one of the Dans, I'm sure, as you've heard referred to on the show. The Dans. The Dans, and my, one of my Facebook friends for his podcast that he's just now starting. But that's going to be at the end. So you have to listen to the whole thing. Ha. Mm -hmm. So what are we going over today, Sarah? The Victorians, of course. What? A whole ass episode. We're doing a whole ass episode. Dedicated to... Those bad shit crazy motherfuckers from golden days. Them. 
<laughs> took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, yes. It'll be, mine will be focused mainly on their fascination with death. Hmm. What are you doing, David? I actually have a couple jobs for you and our listeners that basically no longer exist because the advancement of technology has taken that job away. For the most part, and like better jobs coming along and then trying to, you know, do what you have to do to survive kind of thing. And that's where hookers came from. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, which, you know, technically you could say has come back around with OnlyFans. <laughs> I totally heard that as only vans. <laughs> <like>, Onlyvans.com. <laughs> Where it's, it's like, just like we got a 1978 fucking... Dodge tra- <laughs> tradesman van here. It's what. Yep. <sighs> sorry, took me a minute. Elevator finally hit the top floor. I'm good. Um, ready to get started. So, and not only that, then I was trying to find some other things that people had done for entertainment, but I did find one that was quite interesting that took place mostly in Australia called ghost hoaxing. We'll talk about that. In but your I will time talk now. about that in mind because I wanted to kind of go into something death related with yours. But I also have one invention that was related to death from this time period that's just goofy. But with all that said, I'm going to let you get going here. So super quick kind of background overview of what the Victorian era was. Uh, Victorian era was the time of Queen Victoria's reign from 1837 to 1901. This was a time when building materials had become cheaper, so there was a giant housing boom basically in the 1850s. Mm -hmm. This is when the majority of Victorian houses were erected. Victorian homes were usually single-family residences for the more middle-class citizens and their staff. They had also been used to house numerous factory workers. They lined the very narrow streets with houses that would and could accommodate many people living in just one building. And you know, because of the one you had done about the cemeteries and Mm -hmm. stuff. Yep. Like how packed in they were. The homes were incredibly easy to build in part due to the Industrial Revolution, which resulted in the rising of literally millions of Victorian homes over numerous decades. Okay. Okay. Okay, overview done. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Victorian houses because they do play a huge part in this. When you think of, or at least when I think of Victorian houses, what do you think of? Like the Painted Ladies basically like is what they're called. The houses from the town you're from, those weird pinkish colored ones, they're known as Painted Ladies. Okay, that's not what I think of when I think of Victorian. Well... (laughs) You're probably thinking of like the bit super tall, rounded, aspired part of a house and whatnot. I think of the gorgeous houses like from the Munsters. Right. Yes. Um, With the widows watching everything on top of it. Yes, sir. Some notable Victorian homes that you may know of are one of them is what I've already said. The Munsters home. Um, The house from Full House was considered a Victorian. Okay. The house from Mrs. Doubtfire, also Victorian. Yeah, which makes sense from the time period. Uh Uh-huh. The Creel House. The Creel House? Vecna's childhood home from Stranger Things. Oh, okay. And one of my very, very personal favorites, the murder house from season one of American Horror Story. It's Victorian. Okay. It's a gorgeous house. Anyways, Victorian-style homes were typically made out of stone, wood, or brick. It really depended on the materials that could be gotten a hold of. They were usually two or three stories tall with attic, and it made the absolute perfect open area to allow the servants and sometimes the servants' families to live up in the attic. You know, attics are creepy, and this along with the shadows of servants walking in front of a light up there could have contributed to the ghosts that haunt the attics. Okay. Because, you know, people always say they see something, something's up in the attic. I just saw something move in the attic. Right. Yeah, that could be why. Back then, at least. I just thought of, you know, what's probably considered another Victorian home huh? that's near to, near to us. To us? Yes, the Ruth Mirror. Oh, absolutely. I'll get to that, too. Okay. <laughs> the inside of the Victorian houses, more often than not, included hardwood floors, normally with giant oriental rugs, right. as we've seen. Uh, very large rooms, high ceilings, ornately decorated furniture, 
beautifully tiled hallways, thick and heavy drapes that usually hung from, like, the top of the window to the floor. Intricate wooden staircases, and the handrails are usually pretty intricately carved out. Double doors for most, if not all, rooms that didn't include the bedroom and bathroom. There was usually a beautiful library, which I would love to have. (laughs) Balconies overlooking the first floor, and numerous ornamental decorations throughout. They were usually dark inside, and the wood was carved all over the house, which gave way for light to cast ominous shadows. The sheer size of the homes in the first place gave more than ample room for ghost sightings and investigations to be held. The outside of the houses were fairly similar. They all tended to have very large front porches, large windows of every size from the bottom floor all the way to the top floor. This included stained glass windows as well as bay windows. They had very steep roofs and turrets. You know what turrets I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. There were also dormers. Do you know what those are? Not exactly. Um, They're the little, little windows that... Uh, stick up from the roof with their own little roof. So, like, okay. imagine the front of our place, right. like the top right above the garage, right. how it's peaked. Right. So there would be another little piece that stuck out, like right here, that was a little window that looked like okay. it had. Okay. So you know what I mean. They had iron railings and extremely fancy carved out gables. Do you know what gables are? Nope. <laughs> okay. So again, think of. I'm not an architectural specialist, obviously. <laughs> Uh, think of the thing, the, the triangle thing. above the garage. Okay. Um, basically where your roof meets the peak. That's the word. It would be that big, like open area right underneath, basically the where they meet. Okay. The si- sorry, that was very badly. I was it was all arms and hands, and you couldn't see any of that, but he saw it, and he it was, he got it. Whatever. <laughs> The sizes of of these homes were massive, and I highly suggest if you ever get to tour the inside of one, especially if it's in, like, full period decor, do it. Because you and I have gone through what you had mentioned a minute ago, the Ruth Mirror, um, which is local to us, and it's gorgeous. It is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, We've gone in there once or twice ourselves. Yeah. We've taken my sister through there, and she thought it was gorgeous as well. It is a little creepy in there. Just, uh, just, it, it's a little creepy in there. <laughs> Gorgeous, but creepy. Like, it just, I don't know, different rooms give off different vibes, I guess. Yeah. Do you have any weird feelings in no, there? No, not really. None? Nope. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just the age of the home and not knowing what's happened in the home. Which probably was a whole lot of nothing, just because it was <clears throat> went from the Beardsley family to, I don't remember the family that purchased it after them before the city took over on it. Right. And I don't uh, recall anything, you know, nefarious going on there. Sticking out at you. Yeah. Yes. I definitely suggest if you get a chance to go through one, you go through it. Because it's, it's very interesting just to see, like, even the stuff that they had to replicate right. is not like shit that you see today. So now we're going to dip into something a little more dark. Or something a little bit more macabre. Oh, so much. Insert CSI fucking intro screen here. (laughs) Yep, sure. Okay, with the Victorian era, you better believe a lot of what became popular in that time was sure to come from Her Majesty, Queen Victoria. When her husband, Prince Albert, died of typhoid fever on December 14th in 1861, she went into mourning. So he didn't die from getting stuffed in a can? Prince Albert in a can? Well, you better let him out. It's an old prank call thing about you have Prince Albert in a can? Never mind. I've never heard that. Never mind. The only thing I could think when I heard (laughs) Prince Albert was a dick piercing. (laughs) Clearly this shows where our minds... Like, whose mind is where all the time? You got two types of people. One with stupid jokes and one that's a pervert. <laughs> with Also with stupid jokes. Anyways, um, she and their children were very sad, as anyone in that situation would be. She started wearing traditional mourning clothing, mm-hmm. which is, you know, all black. So you're saying that Queen Victoria is like the mother of all gossip? <laughs> nope. <laughs> that would be Susie. No, but that's funny. <laughs> 
<laughs> the great grandmother of all goths. Is that better? The great great grandmother of all goths. Yes. But yes, traditional morning clothing was black. In fact, from the day that Prince Albert died, she wore nothing but the color black. Like she never wore color after that. It was okay. always just black. And people speculate that this is what caused the more eerie, macabre, morbid tone for the Victorian era. Okay. Was her, you know, kind of just always mourning and being somber. Right. And you have to remember the modern medicine and technology we have now is not what they had back then. The life expectancy in the Victorian era was only half of what it is now, so you can imagine death was something that happened often to those you knew. Most adults didn't live past the age of 50. No. But now if you die around the age of 50, like, that's considered way too young. Yeah, it's like, oh my god, I can't believe it. Yeah. So with that, death became an obsession for everyone. It was something you couldn't escape Something you had no choice but to deal with in terms of others and prepare for in terms of yourself. So back then, when a family member died, they would be laid out inside the house. Which, there's only one population that I can think of now that still does that. Mm, who's that? The Amish. Oh, yeah. Some had dedicated areas within the home where the dead would be placed upon actually dying, usually for others to come in and pay their respects to them. They were sometimes just left in the room in which they died. One thing that people back then did was when a loved one died was going into an immediate period of mourning. If it was a husband or father that died, the wife and children would wear black. The wife had to wear black for one year and then could wear gray for one year, which they called the gray period of mourning. Okay. The children would have would have to wear black as well for one year. The length of time varied depending on who died. So it was different if it was your parents or a sibling or your aunt, uncle, cousins, okay. that kind of thing. Women and children weren't allowed to leave their homes. They weren't allowed to attend events or anything with the exception of going to church. Like that's all they could do when they were in mourning. They weren't. Not be able to leave your house for a fucking year, basically. Except for church. That's a bit much. Yep. They had to stay home and mourn. That's, I mean, yeah. If it was a wife or a mother that died, well, the man was free to come and go as he pleased. Of course. Because, you know, he had to provide for his, his family. Right. Although the husband, um, he did also have to wear black, but he wasn't technically in a mourning period. So he could, he would wear dark suits. It didn't have to be black, but they had to be dark. For up to six months is what this Yeah, said. that's what I, my guess was, is though I'm going to guess that for women, it's only going to be like half the time. Well, for women, it was two years. Well, okay. It I was a year was, in okay. black and then a year in right, gray. That's what I meant was like a year. Like I was just going off the fact of just black for a year, not mm. about the gray. As I'm going to guess this is like half the time and it's going to only be like six months, I bet. Up to six months. Um, okay. Whereas woman it was a year period yeah. like you that's it so the reason that the men were only supposed to wear their dark clothing for up to six months was because they were expected to marry again very quickly of course yeah like deceased grandparents or siblings would warrant wearing morning period clothing for six to nine months aunts uncles cousins warranted a morning period of four to six weeks yeah the surviving spouse would tie a black cloth around the doorknob of the room the dece their deceased loved one's body lay in. I'm not sure what the significance of that was. I couldn't find anything that said why they did that. I tried. I couldn't find anything. All the clocks in the house were stopped and left at the time of their loved one's death. Mirrors would be quickly covered to keep the deceased person's soul from coming back into the house once it left. And to keep their loved one's image from getting stuck in the looking glass. They apparently didn't want ghosts hanging around or something, which right. is a little odd. Which uh, is interesting that you brought this up because in one of the earlier episodes of Scared to Death that I've listened to, uh -huh. they had talked about how mirrors that are mounted on an outside wall of a house is a possibility of being a highway for demons to enter your home. Uh-huh. You've, just, yeah, you've told me about that before. Just, Way before that. 
the further I go, you're going to find that last statement of them not wanting ghosts mm -hmm. in their house to be extremely contradictory. Okay. Oh, that's bright. They would make jewelry to wear out of the hair and teeth of their dead, dead loved one. Like, I get hair. Right. I have a locket in my mom's right. hair. I don't wear it. Right. You just have it. But they would wear theirs. Right. Like, why would you make jewelry out of their fucking teeth? I don't know. And wear it. It just makes me wonder, like, how did they get the teeth? Did they have a professional dentist come in and yank them out after death? Possibility. Like, in today's time, we can look at pictures and videos of our loved ones that have died back in the Victorian era. Not so easy to do. And videography wasn't popular yet. And they and had literally just become a thing as of, like, 1888. Photography was accessible, but it wasn't cheap, so it was usually saved for later in life um, for big events. Um, so this is why death masks became popular. Okay. Do you know what a death mask is? Yeah, they basically take a plaster casting of the deceased's face. Yes. But did you know... <laughs> you already know what I'm going to say, don't you? I don't. But, I but we're not throwing fun facts in this one. A death mask is quite literally a mask that is made from an impression taken of the face of the deceased person. It, it was done to preserve their features and likeness. A mold would be made of the face and then once dried, it would be given to the family. It was something tangible that they could hold and touch when they were missing their loved one. And they usually wound up on a mantle in the house <laughs> after, you know, a All little right. while. Now, what were, what were you going to say? I was going to say that, did you know that the... CPR dummy is actually based off of a death, death mask? Yeah, of a little girl. Mm-hmm. Sure do. Okay, well then, there you go. However, those that are fortunate enough to have the means to pay a photographer to come out and take photos usually did so only after a death. This was called post-mortem photography. There were stands, chairs, and special techniques used to make the dead look alive. For starters, the stands. These were used so the deceased would be propped up standing for a picture. Have you have you ever seen the stands? Um, not the stands itself, but I've seen some of the post-death like pictures. Our coat rack that you have in there, yeah. if you took the prongs off the top, that's basically what it looks okay. like. If they were sitting, they would use a headrest standing up on a rack like that okay. uh, with just a headrest on it so that it would be just touching the base, like the base of their neck to hold the head up. And it wouldn't be seen in pictures. They would also be able to be posed however the family or photographer chose to do so. If it was a baby, they would usually be placed in the mother's arms or laid flat with their head turned slightly towards the camera. To make the deceased look more alive, if their eyes were closed, they would paint their eyelids to make it look like their eyes were open. That was the question I had is how they did the, how they keep the eyes open, but never mind. Yep. <laughs> Uh, the photos would be developed and then given to the family. I'm sure everyone has seen, you know, the post-mortem photography from back then. Right. It's all over Facebook. Like, some of them are so well done that you kind of have to pay, play a game like, which one's the dead one? Right. Um, yeah, because some of them are, like, super well done. They're fascinating photos, and I can only assume that they were entirely cherished by their families. Right. But everyone in those photos is deceased now, and the pictures get taken to Oddity's store to be sold. They get scanned and uploaded to the internet. They're everywhere. There's a site uh, and they called... they mostly end up in clickbait articles now. Yep. There's a website that, well, it started as a Facebook page, and... My mom used to look at the shit all the time, but now it's a website mm -hmm. and you have to pay membership. Um, but you can still see some of their stuff on Facebook, but it's called the Thanatos Archive. You yeah, ever heard of that? Heard of, I have not heard of it. Um, it's a great site. If you, I mean, I'm sure you can see them just by typing in Google. Right. Um, but they have a huge collection of pictures. Like I said, you have to pay for membership. Even they have posted pictures before. They're like as the... People that run this website mm -hmm. that is nothing but post-mortem photography. And even they're like, can you guys figure out which one is, is dead? Right. Just because, yeah, some of them were very well done. Funerals and burials. You ready? 
But we already did this in a, in a couple episodes ago. About what? No, we didn't. I'm just being a smart ass about my or cemetery's origin vi- oh, episode. Oh, no, this is not the same. I know. When the actual funerals for the deceased were held, they were done so within the home, as I had stated before. The bodies would be placed into a glass casket so they could be viewed. If the body had started to show signs of decay that would upset the onlookers, they would be placed in a very traditional closed casket. If it was the case that a couple of children died together or husband, wife, child died together, um, there were family-sized caskets available so that they all could be buried in the same one. Hmm. Yes. The deceased person's family would actually hire professional mourners to appear at the funeral to give the deceased a look of being more established and popular in their society. <laughs> yeah, professional mourners. No, well, I mean, it's like, there's one guy, I think he's in the United Kingdom, he's a professional funeral... He's not a professional mourner, but he you could pay this guy to announce all the secrets that you've known or something like that to, oh. during your eulogy. Oh, that yeah. sounds yeah. a little seedy. <laughs> so the deceased was carried out of their house feet first so that they couldn't look back and call another to join them in death. Hmm. Yeah. There was actually a job position called a funeral mute. Thank you for this one. You're welcome. <laughs> the role of the funeral mute was to wear all black with a black sash or a white sash if they were a child, and carry a long cloth-covered stick. They were to stand aside mournfully and silently by the front door of the deceased person's house before leading the coffin in its procession to the cemetery. When it came to the burials, those were practically the same as they are now in normal cemeteries, as graveyards at that point were practically full. Yep. Yeah. However... There were a couple of things that they did differently. For starters, the Victorians were terrified of being buried alive. And just in case their loved one was in fact not dead, they would insert a rope into the casket before it got lowered into the ground. The rope went all the way up and outside of the hole and was attached to a bell. You don't have this in yours, do you? No. Okay. Just in case the dead wasn't really dead, they could pull the rope and the gravekeepers would hear it. And hopefully get them out before they suffocated. So is this where the term graveyard shift probably originated from then? Probably. I I mean, I would assume. Because that's why they had them there overnight to begin with. Some graves were bricked over just in case a resurrectionist came by needing a body to sell for profit since medical students needed them to learn from. Right. Again, thank you. You're welcome. And a resurrectionist is also known as a grave robber. Grave robber. Resurrectionist sounds more professional. Grave robber. That was from, that's from my movie. Your movie? Yeah, Repo. Oh, I only watched it the one time. Oh, God, I loved it the first time and remembered all the songs. (laughs) Anyways, speaking with the dead. (laughs) Okay. With death being so widely dealt with and the steps they'd go to to make sure everything was done the way it was supposed to after a loved one's death, it was extremely hard for the spouses left alive with, you know, them needing to take care of children, you know, the children and mm-hmm. the family. They had a hard time coping with the death of their spouse, so they sought out ways to communicate with their dead loved ones. Remember earlier I said that it was a little contradictory with them covering up the mirrors because they didn't want the ghosts right. in the house? Right. So they would start out not wanting the ghosts or souls to invade the homes, but they wanted to speak to them. Insert mediums. <laughs> So it's like, oh, quick, cover the mirror so they don't get trapped here. But hey, now we want them to come back. Okay. (laughs) Yes. That makes a whole lot of sense. Yep. This isn't a new concept to us, you know. But back then, everyone believed in mediums. Right. Like wholeheartedly believed in the afterlife and that medians were the real mediums. Medians, Jesus Christ. They believed in the afterlife and that mediums were the real deal and could 100% communicate with their dead loved one. This is when seances became a big thing and also where mediums could make a believer out of anyone with a parlor trick or two. Also, almost every single medium was a female. Because it it would be more believable being from a woman than a man, which would still be odd for this time period. Don't know. 
or is no it because clue. or it has to do with you know oh that's not a man's job you know some had to work in factories if, i don't i don't know fields or whatnot i don't know either but but mediums were always invited to the deceased person's home mm-hmm. and that is where these seances would take place so yes they traveled they didn't have storefronts like they do right. <laughs> like they do now right So at the start of a seance, there would be candles lit all around the room. The medium would have everyone in attendance sit in a circle around a table. You know, the the normal. Right. They would ask a name for the name of the person and begin their show. Once the medium said they could feel a presence in the room, they would ask out loud if the spirit in the room was that of, insert dead loved one's name here. Because right. at the beginning, they ask, what was your loved one's name? Right. And of course, it always was. Always was. Right. They would, well, the way they they clarified that it was the deceased loved one was by saying, if if you are name, rap three times. Right. And the medium would go to tap on the table three times. Right. And that's that's how... Everyone in the room's like, oh, shit, they're here. Right. You know? Um, with the Ruth Muir house, with uh-huh. the floor buzzard that they had. Yeah. I wonder if they ever had possibly held a seance in there, but if uh, one of the Beardsleys wanted to, you know, play a prank on somebody during a possible seance in that dining room, if they would have used their fucking floor buzzer, basically. Oh, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. But they called the, the tapping, they called that rapping. Right. Not like yo, yo, yo. <laughs> but, yeah, rapping. Okay, so the three knocks on the table. This would be done as the spirit communicating with the medium. And, of course, only the medium knew what the knocks meant. Right. Obviously, Shocker. she fucking did it. The medium would then say that the spirit will not make itself known unless the room was dark. So then everyone would get up and go blow out the candles and return to the table. Um, so unfortunately, your loved one will not show themselves unless you pay me an additional four ninety five <laughs> per minute of this for the seance. Correct. This is where the more outlandish parlor tricks would come into play. And there was usually a young child brought in. They would be put in just like a white sheet. Like, think um, Barb and Adam from... Beetlejuice. Oh, so our <laughs> Scoopy ghost of Halloween yes. past from our Halloween yes. bonus episode. No feet. <laughs> yes. Uh, they'd put the white sheet over their head and walk in a circle around the table so the family could feel the wind and draft from the ghost of their loved one. The child would also very lightly, very lightly touch the people sitting at the table to make them feel like their loved one had, mm-hmm. you know touch their shoulder or you know stroked their face whatever i just wonder if they could ever had a bad day and just like bam slap them right <laughs> in the face instead <laughs> i don't know but that'd be great because you know kids are gonna do what they fucking want no matter what you tell them <laughs> it was also said that rarely the medium would allow people at the seance have a chance to touch the lo- their loved one their the spirit of their loved mm-hmm. one By extending their arm out and feeling, usually just at fingertips length, their loved one. Which is, in all reality, feeling a child. (laughs) Martha, why do you feel like a bed sheet? One, there was one that I had, I had read about, um, it was a family whose son had passed away. He was probably 10 or something, if I remember correctly. Okay. And they had a child come in, it was a girl. And when they got to the portion where they were allowing them to extend and touch their loved one, Mm -hmm. well, little boys didn't wear corsets. (laughs) And there was a corset on this little girl. So they were they were pissed. Right. Yeah. Uh, Crystal balls were also used. And once they were once they made contact with the deceased person, the ball would be given to the family and the mediums would tell them, you know, just keep it in the front room, keep it in the window. Did they tell him to fucking cover it also? <clears throat> this wasn't a good idea. <laughs> it's the crystal ball, you know, glass. And when the sunshine hit it for hours on end, it was known to start fires and burn houses down. So <laughs> it wasn't the brightest of moves. While damn near all the people back then believed in mediums and being able to speak with, you know, the souls of their loved ones, mm-hmm. there were skeptics. 
there were men who would show up to every single seance that happened that they knew of that was going to happen. They'd show up unannounced, uninvited. They would watch the whole thing go down and try to debunk what was happening. They were quite literally called debunkers. Like, they did this as, like, a job, but right. never got paid for it. They're just like, this is bullshit. I'm going to come watch. Right. But, yes, huge, huge skeptics. They were able to debunk most of what happened, but no one wanted to hear any of it. Right. You know, they they want to believe what they want to believe. And remember, they fully believed in the afterlife. Right. And they fully believed in mediums. Right. So, for them, like, they, they needed... To believe that all that shit was possible. Right. As whereas now on the Travel Channel, there's that paranormal paranormal caught on tape show. and oh God, I love that show. It's so trashy and bad. Right. And with you even saying that, some other podcasters that I know have actually gone a, on a ghost hunt with the executive producer of that show. Uh-huh. And he told them, don't believe everything you see on that show. Oh, I believe it. Oh, I believe it. So essentially, with them believing as hard as they did and needing to believe as hard as they did, Mm -hmm. uh, debunkers literally just wasted their time and their breath. No one wanted to hear shit that they had to say. Nobody believed the the people that are like, dude, this did not happen. I fucking witnessed what really happened. Oh, no, it really was, Martha. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. As much as the Victorians believed, it never brought their loved ones back. And they never met them again until they themselves died. Of course. Well, that was quite interesting. I didn't really know about the mourning periods and colored palettes you had to wear. Mm -hmm. But Yep. You're in black, you're in gray. Yeah. So. Oh, I forgot to add in there that when they were in their gray period that they could leave the house, but it was only for necessity. Like going to a grocery, you know, going to get groceries or going to pay a bill, whatever. Like it couldn't be to go to parties or anything i'm just curious if there was any kind of like social backlash of you leaving your house in your morning period in your black period i'm or your gray i'm period. sure like, like i told you there was a fucking manual right that i had found online and it was it huge like it like i said it was basically the bible for this is everything you have to do when your deceased person fucking goes right what are you going to tell us about well like i said at the beginning i have a couple of jobs that no longer exist because of the advancement of technology and technology can be literally anything of advancement um one death related invention uh-huh. and a pastime that victorians from australia would do is it something awesome like dragon snapping no, it's not like Snapdragon, but Snapdragon? it's just as it's Dragon just, snapping. It's, it's about just as goofy and it's based off a of lore of Spring Hill Jack, which I think would probably be his own episode for me at some point. Okay. Um now that Sarah has kinda of gone over with the mysticism of the Victorians, I'm going to start with some of the jobs that I had selected for this. Okay. Uh, Before the invention of the alarm clock in 1847, you more than likely would pay someone known as a (laughs) knocker-upper. Not? (laughs) I already know where your mind's going with it, and no, it's not that. (laughs) Like, we're back on male prostitutes this time? (sighs) So, knocker-uppers would wake Victorians at an agreed time, either using a long pole to tap on windows or use a pea shooter Uh and shoot small pebbles and pea-sized stones at their windows. Until they woke up. Uh, one of the best known knocker uppers of this time was a lady by the name of Mary Smith. Okay. Yeah. I know you got something to fucking say. <laughs> just to look on your face. No. I'm not. I didn't say nothing. I'm just. And Mary Smith would make as much as 45 shillings, which would equal out to 76 cents in U.S. dollars. And of course, I had to inflate that son of a bitch like I always do. With, with the a, what? With what? Inflation calculator! <laughs> that comes out to be $77.62 in 2023. An hour? This was like for the week. Oh, shit. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You didn't. I don't think you really <laughs> got paid by the hour in these times. You probably did, but I'm going to assume that this it's amount like, is per week. If, 70, if they were making $77 an hour, shit, I'll go fling some rocks at your window. <laughs> 
Even with this invention of the alarm clock, knocker uppers were around until the 1970s in some areas of London or England itself. Probably like the West End or something. Probably in the smaller towns. And the last one actually retired in 1973. Really? Yeah. Huh. Uh, But also, with as many carriages on the streets during this era, they were covered in sewage, horse shit, dead animals, God knows fucking what else. And uh, being a wealthy Victorian, you probably wouldn't want to get anything on your dress, your dress shoes, no. you know, or anything. So maybe this is where you would toss a coin to your sweeper. Oh, Victorian <laughs> wealthy. Oh, Victorian wealthy. Toss a coin to your sweeper. Yep. There <laughs> Wait, were. Wait, babe, get out the vacuum. <laughs> yes. There were. But a common job was being a crossing sweeper. Okay. Just somebody that would, like, yeah, go literally, and wipe the wall. It was one of the easiest jobs you can create because all you really needed was a broom. Yeah. So they wouldn't get manure and sewage on their large and elaborate dresses or on their dress uh-huh. pants for their suits and things like that. Like I said, many of these people took up this profession because all it cost you was owning a broom. Crossing sweepers would have their own set territories. Oh, shit. I wonder yeah. if some gang activity went down. Yeah, so what? When you would come to your edge of your territory, you and your customer would be may- be met with the next crossing sweeper in that area, and they would take over. It's like you switched? Yeah, because you have marked territories. So... Wait, do these people actually like walk in front of the whoever bought them? And yeah, like they, they are literally walking in front of them, dodging oh, carriages and I'm horses. I'm thinking, and... I'm thinking, like if they, like they just stand there, and if something happens to blow in the road, a horse, you know, shits on the road, they go and clean it up. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Right, I understand that, but they literally walk in front of the person, the people walking behind them, yeah. to make sure it's cleared off before they walk. Yes, that's insane. Yeah. Fuck that. Um, like I was about to say, this job was extremely dangerous because you're dodging all the carriages, wagons, and horses that are in the streets even some of the more elaborate and well-known lucrative areas for crossing sweepers they were actually still protected by police really yep huh. and uh, so if somebody tried to move, probably move in on your territory or your neighbor's territory you know if you have a good enough relationship with them you guys are going to help defend each other's territories and so crossing sweeping wasn't going to work out well for you you could try and be something a little bit more disgusting which was known as a pure finder now, a, a pure finder. Pure? Mm-hmm. P-U-R-E? No, with an, even a name like this, there's nothing pure about it. Oh. Yeah. Pure finders would go out and collect dog shit from the streets of London and sell it to leather tanners to help purify the leather and make it more flexible during the tanning process. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Uh-uh. Dog feces would be mixed with water in pits with the leather to help break down the stiff elastic fe- elastic fibers to make the leather easier to work with. Tanneries would pay higher, would pay higher amounts for the dried out white turds, uh, <laughs> because of the higher concentration of the alkalis inside of them. Ew. Yeah. Like I, I'm just ew. Yeah. Another job that probably you could do if being a pure finder, crossing sweeper wasn't working out for you. Uh, this job is actually looked out below being a common beggar, and this job was known as a tosser or tosher. Okay. Not, I already know where your <laughs> mind is going. We're not talking about tossing cells here or anything. <laughs> I didn't say shit. It's the look on your face, even though they can't see it. Mm-mm. Toshers made their living sifting through the raw sewage for any valuables that could be found. And this was extremely dangerous because of the crumbling sewage tunnels that they had to go through. Pockets of toxic fumes. Large mischiefs of rats being in there and literal tidal waves of human waste. Or some of the hazards these toshers would have to face. Um, toshers generally would work in pairs or large groups and can be easily recognized with their aprons with many pockets and a lantern strapped to their chest. Ew. <laughs> yeah. Is this where is this where Mike's Mike Rose family like originated? <laughs> what with these three jobs? Maybe. I Ugh. don't know. Um, in 1840, it became illegal to enter the sewers, but this didn't stop the Toshers as they would begin their work at night or earn, 
or in the early morning hours before police would be out or they were less present on the streets. That's disgusting. And so now I have one invention that is death related since we did previously discuss before we went through this so we knew who was doing what. Yes. If you were to be a would-be grave robber or a resurrectionist, your profession might have a hidden danger just below the surface. And I'm not talking about the, you know, the spores or the fungus that I had talked about uh -huh. in the cemetery's origin episode. What I am talking about was an invention in 1878 by the man of Philip Clover of Columbus, Ohio. He would invent the coffin torpedo, which consisted of a metal tube filled with gunpowder and metal balls to shoot any would-be grave robbers or res resurrectionists. Damn. Mm-hmm. And how this device worked, the mortuary, the mor not the mortuary, the mortician would place your coffin torpedo inside your casket, would hide it within the lining mm -hmm. or within your clothing, and then the trip wire would be attached to your head to keep it in place, or uh... and also on the inside of the lid. So when the lid would be taken off, it would trigger Boom. and fire the would-be resurrectionist. <laughs> in the grave i mean they're stupid game stupid prizes yeah. uh four years late four years later in 1881 a man by the name of thomas and hal would paint the grave landmine -uh. <laughs> yeah which unlike clover's torpedo buried inside the coffin the grave landmine was buried above the coffin that it was attached to on the outside and that instead of being on the inside so they'd hit that and die before they even got mm -hmm. to the wow so they, my guess, I couldn't find really look find into how much the grave landmine worked. Uh -huh. My guess is how it would be they would just find this piece of debris since it's attached to the coffin that they would find this piece of debris to cry and probably grab it to pull it up out uh, up out of the way and then it would possibly detonate from when the trip wire was pulled out of it. Hey. The grave landmine was advertised as "Sleep well, sweet angel. Let no fears of ghouls disturb thy rest." From above the shrouded form lies a torpedo, ready to make mincemeat of anyone who attempts to convey you to the pickling vat. There isn't any real evidence that can be found on how many of these torpedoes and landmines were actually effective, but you can actually find the patents for both of these devices on the internet. All you have to do is Google patent for coffin torpedo, and that's what I did to find some of the information on what its crazy. construction. There was an article listed for one lady that she was actually buried with all of her valuables and had multiple uh, the landmines buried with her in her plot and actually had armed guards as well, too, for but didn't say for a set amount of time. But everybody in this town knew about the landmines in her grave. Wow. I mean, if you got the money, yeah, right. why not? I mean, with when I talked about on the cemetery episode about how elaborate they were about things, too, if you had the money, I mean... right. Victorian mausoleums and grave sites were basically dick swinging contests for the time. <laughs> right. And, uh, right. Lack of a better term. And uh, towards the end of the Victorian times in the Australian state of Victoria, there was a ghost problem, but not as the same ghost as you would need a seance for, as Sarah talked about, but it passed them they had called ghost hoaxing. Ghost hoaxing happened between the 1890s and the 1900s and it was inspired by Spring Hill Jack, which is folklore from London, England, and allegedly was first spotted in 1837. Spring Hill Jack is actually in Assassin's Creed Syndicate. I, I know the name. Okay, so the name sounded a little familiar when you said it the first time, mm -hmm. but if that's the reason why, I remember watching you play that game from yep. start to finish. Remember so. the guy that would chase across the roofs and then yes. would just disappear in a cloud of yep. smoke? That's okay. What Spring the Hill... one that you had to to follow the leave trail. Mm, kind of yes. similar to that. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know who to you're the, about. that, but that was a different Assassin's yes. Creed. But yeah, this is the guy that had to chase across the roof and he would just disappear out of nowhere. Yep, and you had to follow him. Yeah. Sets. Yep. Uh, these Australians would sometimes dress up as the ghosts and, like Spring Hill Jack, would terrorize passerbyers for their own amusement or use ghost hoaxing for committing crimes. Ugh. Some of these crimes would be assault, indecent exposure, sexual assault, and egg theft. Now, I egg tried... Th egg? Egg theft. <laughs> kind of like what's going on right now in the grocery <laughs> store. That's, that's egg rape. <laughs> 
But I tried to see what exactly what egg theft was mm-hmm. in the Victorian times. Couldn't find really a clear answer. With the help of a new t- invention known as phosphor- phosphorescent paint, this would allow these ghost hoaxers to have a glow-in-the-dark appearance and to seem more menacing. Oh. This paint would give them a green to bluish green glow. Unfortunately, they didn't know that this type of paint would eventually would start to cause cancer and even sometimes death, probably. Oh, no. It would probably cause, create hypoxia. Oh. For having their skin closed yeah. closed off because I've read in the past about people painting in gold paint having this issue. I think if I remember correctly, they did an episode, like early episode of Mythbusters about that. Did they? I believe so. In like in the very like first five seasons. I never really watched it until I got with you. Mm-hmm. Most believe that these ghost hoaxes were just rowdy teenagers causing mischief or known as larrikins in Australia. That was what they their term for rowdy kids were. Okay. And you know, with, you know, punk kids like they would be here in the United States. Right. It would turn out that most of these ghosts were actually adults. <laughs> okay. Anywhere from people being a clerk, which is basically somebody with an office position, mm-hmm. to school teachers, and one was actually a well-known public speaker for the time. He's actually one of the more documented cases of this ghost hoaxing that I'm going to have towards the end. Okay. Um, some of the sources also did state that some of these groups were also middle-aged women doing this. Really? Mm-hmm. One of... The sources I read that they would say in London that England, when there was a ghost hoaxing time, that women were paint themselves completely in this glow in the dark paint, Uh completely nude as well. I'm sure they loved that. (laughs) And terrorized police officers, basically. (laughs) That's what they would do. As some might have thought, like this was harmless fun, but as a community, it was actually becoming a huge problem and people started to be hoaxer vigilantes. Oh my goodness. So they were. Victorian age Ghostbusters. All right, sorry. <laughs> in 1896, a veteran by the name of Charles Horman would appoint himself as a one man army against the hoaxers. And I do have some examples of some of these ghost hoaxes. He would open fire on one teen with a shotgun impersonating a ghost, and he would also use a cane on another hoaxer that was assaulting a woman. Parents of children that fell victim to these ghost hoaxers would also start taking the law into their own hands as well, as one woman would un- unleash her pet pit bull on one of these ghost hoaxers that attacked her daughter. And also near the end of the time of ghost hoaxing, a one of these hoaxers was chased down and beaten by a mob in his glowing ghost costume for harassing, harassing an elderly man. Jesus. So here's some of the examples that I did have. That were, there's quite a few, and they're all quite interesting in their own, so I included all of them. <laughs> of course you did. This first one in Ballarat, Australia, one of these hosters would be known as the Wizard Bombardier. He would often be seen wearing white robes and a sugar loaf hat, <laughs> a more, more rounded type cowboy hat. Okay. Or a wizard's hat for the most part, but just more rounded off at the top. His tactics were to disorient people down on the streets below by yelling at them before he'd start throwing rocks and other objects at them before making his escape. In Bendigo, Australia, a more macabre approach would be taken in doubling down on the fear by setting up their ghost hoaxing grounds near cemeteries and painting skull and crossbones nearby to heighten the pedestrians' fear before making their attack. God. In 1895, but without an unknown location... One of these ghost hoaxers would dress up as a knight with a sword and shout, prepare to meet thy doom, and then threaten them with decapitation before chasing after them. And also in another one from this year, when in a location not given as well, some of these ghost hoaxers would wear a coffin on their back to appear as they just rose from the, <laughs> rose from the grave. I mean, that's a hell of an accessory. Yeah. I mean, it's like in Hello for the Magic Tavern in the beginning part of the season. Isidore has been wa- walking around with a bed strapped to his head because he's supposed to be on his deathbed. And he has I death- love him so much. He has deathbed carved out on the headboard as well, too. <laughs> in 1890 and then again in 1889, a woman would incorporate music with her ghost hooks by playing the guitar outside a hotel as she sulked around the area. As I had mentioned previously, that one of these ghost hoaxes was from someone well-known in their community. A man by the name of Herbert Patrick McLennan would don a top hat, a frock coat. It's more of a formal style of a trench coat that comes down to the knees. Uh-huh. You see mostly people who ride horses wear a coat similar to this. Okay. And he would also 
whereas you know boots didn't specify what type of boots just boots my guess probably is formal riding boots if he had a horse uggs 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 of the times <laughs> He would also carry a cat of nine tails, which do you know what a cat of nine tails sure is? Do. Okay, I figure you probably did. That is uh <clears throat> childhood's fucking corn dogs. <laughs> childhood's corn dogs. You never yeah. You pull them out of the ground and A cat of nine tails? Yeah. We didn't uh cat of nine tails is a, actually a whip with nine smaller strands. Oh. Yeah. Okay, then we are not talking about So yeah, thing. apparently you know we're not. Okay, so you know like a swamp. Right, I know what you There's, mean. Yeah, that's what they used to call them. The, a cat of nine tails? Yeah. That's... Up there? That's news to me, because anytime I've ever heard of a uh, cat of nine tails, it has to do with the torture device. So. What do you call the corn dog things down here? I don't know, now that you've asked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember now, because I've never had to use the term before in so fucking long. Are oh, you going to Google it now? Yeah. Yeah, cat of nine tails or a cat tail. Okay. It's, yeah, they look like corn dogs. You bite them and it's just all this billowy no. shit. That's why I'm like, yeah, I know what that is. No. Hell yeah, I do. Oh, it's a whip. <sighs> Kinky. <laughs> I was like, yeah, cat of nine tails, I'm talking about is completely different. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Anyhow, so um, this man, like I said, he would carry this cat of nine tails. Not the nature's corn dog, as we just found <laughs> the, out. The forbidden corn dog. Yeah, the forbidden corn <laughs> corn dog. And he would whip women with it that he encountered. Oh. A bounty of five pounds equaling to six dollars and three cents and inflated to twenty twenty three comes out to two hundred one dollars and ninety one cents today. McLennan waged war on the authorities and threatened to shoot anyone that came after him. He would address local leaders, which he would refer to himself as the ghost. McLennan would actually be arrested eventually for all this, but unfortunately, as his job as a powerful clerk in his area and a public speaker as well, he would be sent to jail still, but he would fortunately be released shortly after he arrived. Of course. I cannot find any information on if he continued on being a ghost hoaxer as well after this arrest, but with the start of World War I, it would start falling out and they stopped yeah. seeing death as being a cheeky and fun thing. Yeah, I'd hope so. At that point, because Australian armed forces lost approximately somewhere between fifty to 60,000 soldiers in World War One. Damn. But That's a lot of people. One other thing that I did add it, I forgot that in that I just remembered, mm. uh, a pastime of the wealthy Victorians was mummy unwrapping parties. Do it, explain. So during this time period, the wealthy Victorians... And there was an Egypt Omania fad, as it was called. Okay. Everything Egyptian for the most part. Huh. Like Feeny Babies, but everything Egyptian. So the wealthy Victorians would go to Cairo and you know, find a mummy, then they would bring it back, and then they would host unwrapping parties. Are you fucking serious? Yep. I'm serious. That's ballsy. Yeah. And then one of the parlor games that I did find in, I think it's Blind Man's Bluff. Okay. The rules are a lot more rougher in Victorian times than they were are now. In, like, the Victorian rules, you could use furniture to block them. <laughs> so, yeah, in the Victorian version age of uh, Blind Man's Bluff, you could probably end up with serious injury or death. Wow. Yeah, they took their parlor games super serious then. No shit. <laughs> but that's a little bit of more fun Victorian stuff for you guys for this go round. So with that said, at the beginning of this episode. Oh yes. So before we get into that, yes. what did you think about the jobs and the my things from that I had brought to everybody? Uh, I thought they were intriguing. The street sweeper, not street sweeper. What do you call it? Crossing them? sweeper. Crossing sweeper. Um, I mean, I, I get it. I get it. Right. The ones that would go down in the sewers and, like, wade through the shit? Yeah. Nope. Yeah, and the tossers were actually considered lower than being a street beggar. Then why would you do it? You know, just already hundreds of people and, you know, begging on the streets and you're going to try and do better than them, I guess. If I didn't have a job and the area around us was oversaturated with people also mm -hmm. looking for a job, right. you still would not find my ass down in a sewer right. wading through other people's shit. Right. No, I mean, hoping, just hoping that you might right. find something of value. Right. 
that got flushed on accident. And then, you know, you got to worry about all the gases and... Yeah. The, I mean, you've the, got enough. The mischief of rats, basically. For those that don't know, mischief for rats is a large group of rats, basically. Yes. And we're not talking about, like, six. We're talking about hundreds yes. of rats. Well, anything above uh, three can be considered a mischief. Okay. Well, I wasn't sure the exact yeah. number. It's just a large... A, Even a though large your excitement on the face of that, I, it's something I wouldn't fuck with. But street rats? No, absolutely oh, no. not. Absolutely no, no. not. No, no. I would not either. They're cute. But I'm going to fuck with them. Even though that one temple in India, that would be kind of interesting to go to. Oh, that would. Yes, where they're just like running around mm-hmm. all over the place while you're trying to sit there and like do whatever you do in a right. temple. Mm-hmm. Bow your head and stuff. You know. Yeah. That would be cool. But, so, yeah, it's like... That car- the coffin torpedo, I wanted to send you that, but I was like, no, I'm gonna yeah. keep I'm keeping that to myself. And yeah, I think you had said something like you wanted to tell me about one, and I'm like, no, I don't have that in there. You didn't tell me what it was. You just said, right. do you have anything in there about coffin yeah. torpedo? I'm like, nope. You yeah. keep it though, because I've already got enough shit in mind. Right. So now well, that's that. I thought it was very interesting. Yep. Good so, job. I hope you guys found it more or more more victorian information and fun i'm sure we'll find more along the way every fucking episode we do at the beginning of this episode i had mentioned that i wanted to help promo a new podcast from one of my time suck friends one of the dans one of the dans uh his name of his show is called the phantasmagoric oddities emporium phantasmagoric that is a fantastic name yeah way to go whoever you are his name is paul way to go paul (laughs) Uh, but he calls, so we'll call it the Poe. What it basically is, is that he's creating a fun little story about different things through history, like his very first episode, how calendars came about. Mm-hmm. And he tells a bit of a story along the way with it. It's been a couple of days since I've listened to it, so I don't remember clearly towards the end of it. He ends up going through one of the doorways of the Poe because it's each time period is behind a doorway. Uh-huh. And he was fighting a monster and... Him and the monster end up going through this doorway before it disappeared. I'm sorry, Paul, if I don't remember exactly at the time we're recording this. But I found it quite fun and interesting if you want to learn about more history type stuff. Uh, he is going to only be doing bi-weekly right now. His first episode is out. So at the time he recorded this, his release date was for his first episode. That's episode five of not the actual first episode. It was started shortly after we did. Well, he's recorded some things and he put it out there. Just Mm -hmm. a different couple of different things. And he he put it all together into this very first official episode that was released this month. Gotcha. And he released it on Sunday. So two weeks from this past Sunday of that was on the first. So his next episode for that would be on the 15th. Teens, if I'm correct. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know what his next episode's going to be. He's kind of, I'm probably going to be a little bit mysterious, like we are not tell what our next episodes are going to be. Oh, he's one of those. No, yeah. one of those. We're kind of one of those too. Yes. So I don't know who you are, but welcome to the podcast game. <laughs> he's actually been around a little bit longer with, and he's answered some of my questions also. Well, then I take that back. <laughs> I hope your show does well. So with that said, I think it might be time we close up the Emporium for today, sir. What do you think? I agree. And with that said, remember to creep it real. Our website is live. Make sure you check it out at macabreemporiumpodcast.com. Join our Facebook group and follow us on Twitter at Macabre Emporium. Like and subscribe to us on YouTube at Macabre Emporium Podcast. And if you have any stories of paranormal true crime, whether it be local or a story you you know you may have heard, weird history you want us to look into and possibly do an episode on or include within an episode, email us at macabemporiumpod at gmail.com. And remember to follow, rate, review, and share wherever and whenever you can and help us grow our little baby podcast. And but with that said, I think it might be time we close up the Emporium for today, Sarah. What do you think? Yep, I agree. Yep, I agree. Because <laughs> <laughs> you weren't paying attention. I was not, sorry.